This presentation, we will start the Book of Ether in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Ether, and we will consider chapters 1 through 5. So, by way of introduction, the Book of Mormon is not arranged in chronological order. If it were, the Book of Ether would be listed first. The Jaredite record begins approximately 2200 B.C. First Nephi begins in 600 B.C. The Book of Ether covers over 1,700 years of history, from the 2200 B.C. down to the time of Coriantumr. We don't know exactly when Coriantumr lived, but it was somewhere between 500 and 250 B.C. The rest of the Book of Mormon, from the books of 1 Nephi to Moroni, cover approximately 1,000 years of history. Following the flood in Noah's day, many descendants of those who had been spared became wicked. One group of people attempted to build a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. The story of the Jaredite nation began with the building of the Tower of Babel. The Lord dealt with the widespread wickedness by confounding the common language and by scattering the people across the face of the earth. The brother of Jared pleaded with the Lord to preserve the language of his worthy friends and family. Demonstrating great faith and led by the hand of God, the brother of Jared was able to lead his group to another land. The story of this migration is filled with important principles that we can apply to our lives today. These principles include the exercise of faith to receive divine assistance and the role of prayer in accomplishing difficult tasks. As you study the life of the brother Jared, you will learn of the blessings that come when individuals exercise strong faith. Here is a review of the origins of the book of Ether. One Jaredite prophets kept the history until a final Jaredite prophet named Ether. Limhi's search found part of the Jaredite record in the form of 24 gold plates. King Mosiah translated the Jaredite record. Moroni abridged or edited the Jaredite record and included it before his own writings. With that, let's go to Ether chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, Moroni explains that he is abridging the record called the Book of Ether, contained on the 24 gold plates that were discovered by the people of Limhi. You can see that in Mosiah and Alma. And that his abridgment does not contain a full account. The full account including important information concerning the creation and happenings among the people from Adam down to the time of the Tower of Babel. We note Moroni's recognition that a record of these things is had among the Jews, meaning the Bible. Undoubtedly, Moroni was also familiar with Nephi's prophecies that with Nephi's prophecies that the record of the Jews would have many plain and precious things removed from it. Hence, the person who would bring Moroni's record to light in the last days would also have power that he may get the full account of those things on the plates of Ether. This statement may have reference, at least in part, to the sealed portion of the place delivered to the prophet Joseph. These plain and precious things, the full account of the creation and the history of God's dealings with his children from Adam to the Tower of Babel, surely will be among those many great and important things that will yet be revealed. The Lord has promised that as we prepare ourselves spiritually, both as a church and as individuals, important things have been sealed or hidden from the world will be revealed to us. Elder Neil A. Maxwell stated, just as there will be many more church members, there will also be many more nourishing and inspiring scriptures. However, we must first feast worthily upon that which we already have. That is good counsel. The reason we have not received the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon or any other parts of the Book of Ether that has yet been translated is because we have not fully used the Book of Mormon as we should. It's up to us, brothers and sisters, when we will get additional scripture. Chapter 1, verses 6 through 33. The phrase, On this wise do I give the account, the Jaredite genealogy. Ether 1 gives a genealogy of the prophet Ether. This genealogy is a rare occurrence in the Book of Mormon and is explained by the following commentary. Genealogies are common in the Bible. The Hebrew took great, Hebrews people took great interest in their family histories and genealogies seem to have been carefully kept. 
The number in the scriptures is an index to their importance. Notice those in Genesis 5, 11, 46, Numbers 21, 1 Chronicles 1 through 9. Read also the accounts in Ezra 9 through 10, which give an indication of the importance of keeping family histories. The Book of Mormon, however, contains only one example of an extended genealogy. That found in Ether, chapter 1, verses 6 through 32. It gives the genealogy of Ether, the last prophet of the Jaredite people, whose lineage is traced back 29 generations or more to Jared, who left the Tower of Babel with his family at the time of the confounding of the languages of the people. Aside from this example, only scattered reference of gene genealogical interest are found. It may be that Moroni is not giving, nor did he necessarily intend to give, a complete genealogy of Ether. This would possibly explain why he uses son of in some cases and descendants of in others. It may be that to save space, he is merely illustrating the ge several generations that span from Jared and his brother at the time of Babel to Ether, the last of the Jaredite prophets. Chapter 1, verse 34, the brother of Jared. Moroni nowhere gives us the name of Jared's brother, but consistently refers to him as the brother of Jared. From the account, it is clear that he is highly favored of the Lord and is the spiritual leader of Jared's people. Why is his name not recorded in the Book of Mormon? Daniel H. Ludlow has suggested three possible reasons. One, the brother of Jared himself may, out of modesty, have purposely omitted his name from the record in a similar manner as John did in recording his gospel. Two, the final writer on the record or plates of Ether, a descendant of Jared, perhaps emphasized the name of his progenitor. Or three, Moroni may have found the name too difficult to translate adequately into the Nephite language. So maybe it's one of those three or a combination of all of those three. The name of the brother of Jared was revealed to the prophet Joseph Smith. Elder George Randalls recounted, Quote, while residing in Kirtland, Elder Reynolds Cahoon had a son born to him. One day, when President Joseph Smith was passing his door, he called the prophet in and asked him to bless and name the baby. Joseph did so and gave the boy the name of Moranhai Moriankamer. When he had finished the blessing, laid the child on the bed, and turning to Elder Cahoon, he said, The name I have given your son is the name of the brother of Jared. The Lord has just shown or revealed it to me. Elder William F. Cahoon, who was standing near, heard the prophet make this statement to his father. And this was the first time that the name of the brother Jared was known in the church in this dispensation. End of quote. Chapter 1, verses 35 to 37. Therefore he did not confound the language of Jared. Ether 1, 35-38 records that the Lord did not confound the language of the Jaredite's family, his brothers and their friends, at the time of the Tower of Babel. President Joseph Fielding Smith taught that the Jaredites likely spoke in the language of Adam. Quote, it is stated in the book of Ether that Jared and his brothers made the request of the Lord that their language be not changed at the time of the confusion of tongues at the Tower of Babel. Their request was granted, and they carried with them the speech of their fathers, the Adamic language, which was powerful, even in its written form, so that things Moron, Moron High, Maron, Moroni wrote were mighty even unto the overpowering of men to read. That was the kind of language Adam had, and this was the language which Enoch had, was able to accomplish his mighty work. End of quote. Chapter 1, verse 38 through 42. And who knoweth but the Lord will carry us forth into a land which is choice above all of the earth? Just as members of the house of Israel are called chosen people, chosen to do the Lord's work, the Book of Mormon refers to America as a chosen land, chosen to be the place for the restoration of the gospel and eventually the new Jerusalem. Both the members of the house of Israel and Americans have been chosen to assist Heavenly Father in spreading the gospel throughout the world. President Joseph Finley Smith explained that all of North and South America is a choice land. Quote, the Book of Mormon informs us that the whole of America, both North and South, is a choice land above all other lands in the word, in other words, Zion. The Lord told the Jaredites that we'd lead them to a land which is choice above all the lands of the earth. End of quote. 
President Ezra Taft Benson also spoke of the Americas being a choice land. Quote, in 1844, the prophet Joseph Smith made his solemn proclamation, the whole of America is Zion itself from north to south. The Lord himself decreed, this is a land which is choice above all other lands. This nation is a part of the land of Zion. This is a land dedicated by God's servants. When a Book of Mormon prophet returned to the nation of the world, this hemisphere was designated as good. End of President Benson's quote. Chapter 1, verse 43. This long time have ye cried unto me. The Lord explained to the brother of Jared that blessings come to his people as a result of prayers offered over a long time. Enduring obedience coupled with frequent and persistent prayers is powerful. In an 1839 discourse in Commerce, Illinois, the prophet Joseph Smith taught, quote, God is not a respecter of persons. We all have the same privilege. Come to God, weary him until he blesses you. We are entitled to the same blessings, end of quote. President Spencer W. Kimball eloquently spoke of the effort, both spiritually and mentally, that is required to receive answers to our prayers. Quote, Great decisions must be made by most of us. The Lord has provided a way for those answer, these answers. If the question is which school, what occupation, where to live, whom to marry, or such other vital questions, you should do all that is possible to solve it. Too often, like Oliver Cowdery, we want our answers without effort. The Lord does answer our prayers, but sometimes we are not responsive enough to know when and how they are answered. We want the writing on the wall, or an angel to speak, or a heavenly voice. There must be, book, there must be works with faith. How fruitful it would be to ask the Lord to give us knowledge, but the Lord will help us to acquire knowledge, to study constructively, to think clearly, and to retain things we have learned. Do you get answers to your prayers? If not, perhaps you did not pray the price. Do you offer a few trite words and worn out phrases? Or do you talk intimately to the Lord? Do you pray occasionally when you should be praying regularly, often, consistently? Do you offer pennies to pay heavenly debts when you should give dollars to erase that obligation? When you pray, do you just speak or do you also listen? The Savior said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him, and he will sup with him, and he with me. The Lord stands knocking. He never retreats, but he will never force himself upon us. If we ever move apart, it is we who move and not the Lord, and we should ever, f and we should ever fail to get an answer to our prayers. We must look into our lives for a reason. End of quote. Let's go to Ether, chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 4, the phrase, The Lord came down and talked with the brother Jared, and he was in a cloud. Just as Jehovah appeared to and conversed with Moses and led the children of Israel in the wilderness in a cloud by day and in a pillow filled by, by night, so did he lead the Jaredites as they were in the wilderness. From this cloud of glory, the Lord directed them and gave them directions for their journey. The image of a cloud associated with the Lord's appearance is not unique to his dealings with ancient peoples. In this dispensation, the Lord also spoke of a cloud of glory, one that will surround him when he again returns to the earth and appears to man. Chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. He would that they should come forth even to the land of promise, which was a choice land above all other lands, which the Lord God preserved for a righteous people. The Lord preserved the American continent as a choice land to which he could lead a righteous people where they could prosper in a land of freedom. To the brother of Jared and the band of people who journeyed with him, with him that should be with him, sorry. Whoops. That journeyed with them, the Lord promised the land of inheritance that was choice above all of their lands. This promise to the Jaredites as well as to Lehi and his seed is conditional. Freedom from bondage and captivity is assured by the Lord, but only on principles of righteousness. Only a righteous people can possess and prosper in this promised land. A wicked people who will not serve him, the true and only God, will eventually be swept off from the face to the earth. That is a great warning to us, brothers and sisters, in America. 
Do we have our wickedness among us? The child trafficking, the sexual abuse, and everything that goes on in America. We are in danger of being swept off the land of promise if we do not repent and come unto Christ. America will not be immune to the judgments of God if they do not heed and follow God in righteousness. The entire Book of Mormon, as an account of the Judites, Mulekites, and Nephites, stands as a living testimony of the truth, truthfulness of these conditional promises and prophecies. Because of what he sees with his own people's destruction and reads of the Judites, Moroni speaks plainly to us of the last days. His words echo the warning of the Lord of the Lord that inhabitants of this promised land will be protected and preserved from bondage only if they will but serve the God of this land. President Joseph Finley Smith testified of this prophecy, quote, These passages of Scripture from the Book of Mormon are true. This nation is not exempt, and the people, if they continue to pursue the course of evil and ungodliness that they are now treading, shall eventually be punished. If they continue to discard the warnings of the warning voice of the Lord, deny the Redeemer, turn from his gospel into fables and false theories, and rebel against all that he has through his servants in the this day declare for the sal- in this day declared for the salvation of man and if they increase in the practice of iniquity i want to say to you that if they do these things the judgment of the lord will come upon this land and this nation will not be saved we will not be spared from war from famine from pestilence and finally from destruction as a nation Therefore, I call upon the people, not only Latter-day Saints, but to all throughout the whole land, to repent of their sins and to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Redeemer and God of this land. Turn from your evil ways, repent for your sins, and receive the fullness of the gospel through the waters of baptism and obedience, that judgments will be poured out upon the ungodly may pass by you. End of quote. That's a stern warning from a prophet of God. President W. Kimball once said that Jesus Christ is under no obligation to save this world. That is profound, brothers and sisters. It is up to us and our righteousness whether we will be saved. President Ezra Taft Benson has likewise testified of the conditional promises of of preservation of America. Quote, righteousness exalteth the nation. This is the key to understanding our heritage, and this is the key to maintaining it. The foundations of America are spiritual. They must never be forgotten nor doubted. There are some in this land among whom I count myself whose faith is that this land is reserved only for a righteous people, and we remain here as tenants only as we remain in the favor of the Lord, for he is the landlord as far as this earth is concerned. If we are to remain under heaven's benign protection and care, We must return to those principles which have brought us our peace, liberty, and prosperity. Our problems today are essentially problems of the spirit. The solution is not more wealth, more food, more technology, more government, or instruments of destruction. The solution is personal and national reformation. In short, it is to bring our national character ahead of our technological and material advances. Repentance is the sovereign remedy to our problems. Boy, may we heed that warning and counsel again from a prophet of God. Chapter 2, verse 14, the phrase, and chastened him because he remembered not to call upon the name of the Lord. It seems highly unlikely that a man of the spiritual stature of the brother of Jared, one who had received marvelous manifestations and had previously exercised great faith in the Lord, would suddenly cease praying to his maker. It may be that what his, this verse is trying to say, is saying to us is that Mahanrai Moriankamer was chastened by the Lord because he had not, because he had, I'm sorry, that should be had, because he had not fully followed and implemented the counsels the Lord previously received. It may be that in the relative comfort of the seashore, he had allowed his prayers to become less fervent, more casual, and routine, 
He may have been calling upon the Lord in word, but not in faith and deed. Verse 13 perhaps suggests that they dwelt in tents upon the seashore for the space of four years. The Lord had taught them and prepared them, but it appears that they had tarried too long for which the brother of Jared was chastened. That is one of the dangers of when we or don't have trials that are upon us and afflictions and different infirmities, that when things are going well, that sometimes we become more casual and routine in our spiritual condition. And the Lord needs to chasten us so that we will come back to him with full purpose of heart. The message and application of this episode for us today may be twofold. One, that calling upon the Lord is much more than merely saying prayers. President Spencer W. Kimball taught that we should not ask a church leader for advice, then disregard it. We must never ask the Lord for blessings, then ignore the answer. Calling upon the Lord requires not only frequency and fervency of prayer, but also action, commitment to do what the Lord commands, and to implement his counsel promptly. Number two, from the Lord's chastening, the brother Jared, we see also the danger of pausing too long in one place when we need to be moving onward, forward, and upward. Perhaps it was fear of the long ocean journey, complacency created by the comforts of the seashore, or the natural tendency to want to be commanded in all things that caused them to delay their journey. Whatever the reason, the Lord desired them as he desires us to press forward. Perhaps the Lord was chasing the brother Jared in much the same way as President Spencer W. Kimball chastened and prodded the church. Quote, we have paused on some plateaus long enough, he declared. Let us resume our journey forward and upward. Let us quietly put an end to our reluctance to reach out to others, whether in our own family, wards, or neighborhoods. We have been diverted at times from fundamentals on which we must now focus in order to move forward as a, pe- as a person or as a people. End of quote. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, the corner of the Twelve Apostles, commented on the strength of character it takes to endure chastening. Quote, It is difficult to imagine what a three-hour rebuke from the Lord might be like, but the brother Jared endured it. With immediate repentance and prayer, this prophet again sought guidance for the journey they had been assigned and those who were to pursue it. God accepted his repentance and lovingly gave further this direction for their critical mission. Chapter 2, verses 15, verse 15, I will forgive thee, but thou shalt not sin any more. Confession and forsaking sin are the indicators of true repentance. This concept of forsaking is often misunderstood to mean that one merely stops committing the particular sin of which he is repenting. The ceasing of one's designated sin at a time is necessary and is certainly one element of forsaking, but to view the scriptural concept of forsaking sin only by this narrow and compartmentalized definition may rob us of a complete perspective of the true nature of repentance. It is the broader view of repentance that the Lord is teaching the brother Jared by commanding him not to sin any more. Attempting to give up one specific sin while clinging tenaciously to others can be characterized as fragmentary forsaking, which is antithetical to the forsaking required of the Lord for one to be totally forgiven. President Spencer W. Kimball taught, quote, That transgressor is not fully repentant who neglects his tithing, misses his meetings, breaks the Sabbath, fails in his family prayers, does not sustain the authorities of the church, breaks the word of wisdom, does not love the Lord nor his fellow men. A reforming adulterer who drinks or curses is not repentant. The repenting burglar who has sex play is not ready for forgiveness. God cannot forgive unless a transgressor shows a true repentance which spreads to all areas of his life. End of quote. King Lamoni's father reflected the proper perspective of forsaking as an element of genuine repentance when he declared, I will give away all of my sins to Nobi and be saved at the last day. His forsaken sin was not selective. It was total surrender. When the Savior says, Go thy way and sin no more in John 8, 11, it is this total forsaking of which he speaks, not selective or fragmented forsaking of sin. True repentance that yields forgiveness requires, as President Joseph S. Smith stated, quote, a discontinuance of all evil practices and deeds, a thoroughly reformation of life, a vital change from evil to good, from vice to virtue, from darkness to light. End of quote. 
chapter 2, verses 16 through 25. In these verses we read of the Lord's instructions to the brother of Jared concerning the manner in which the barges should be built that should carry them across the ocean. What is darkly significant about these verses is not so much the content of the Lord's instructions concerning the shape of the barges, the means whereby oxygen was made available, or the lighting of the interior, but rather the process whereby the brother Jared came to acquire this important information. What will ye that I should do? was the Lord's response to the brother of Jared's prayerful petitions that outlined the group's predicament and their special needs. Implicit in the Lord's question is the Lord's expectation. He expected Maury Ankimer, and expects each of us as well, to use his intellect and his common sense as he seeks solutions to his problem. Oliver Cowley learned this lesson the hard way when the Lord told him that he could not translate because he had erroneously assumed that he would grant him his desire merely for the asking. Behold, you have not understood, but you have supposed that I would give it unto you, when you took no thought, save it was to ask me. Behold, I say unto you, that you must study it out in your mind, and then you ask me if it be right. It may be that we approach our prayers the way Oliver did. It may be that we all too often, when we are praying about our problems and our own unique needs, the Father may be saying to us, What will ye that I should do? We may be forfeiting greater personal revelation and inspired instructions from the Lord because expecting the Lord to do all the work. We give no serious study or thought to the solution, but merely ask. Receiving revelation is often a strenuous endeavor that requires intellectual effort coupled with faith and spiritual yearnings. That is good counsel. That is good doctrine and principles. The Lord wanted the brother of Jared to study out and to use his intellect to figure out problems, and then come to him. Chapter 3, Ether, Chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Obtaining light was a growing experience. Elder Robert D. Hales of the Corner of the Twelve Apostles compared the experience of the brother of Jared to our own experiences. Quote, These vessels had no light. This concerned the brother Jared. He did not want his family to make their journey in darkness, and so rather than waiting to be commanded, he took his concern to the Lord. And the Lord said unto the brother Jared, What will you that I should do, that you may have light in your vessels? The brother of Jared answered, and the brother of Jared's answer to this question required diligent effort on his part. He climbed Mount Shelem and did molten out of a rock sixteen small stones. He then asked the Lord to test these stones that they would bring forth light. As parents and leaders, we must remember that it is not meet that the Lord should command in all things. Like the brother Jared, we must carefully consider the needs of our family members, make a plan to meet those needs, and then take our plan to the Lord in prayer. This will require faith and effort on our part, but he will help us as we seek his assistance and do his will. End of quote. The Lord wants us to grow and learn as we make our own decisions. He also wants to take our conclusions, wants us to take our conclusions to him frequently for his confirmation. When the brother Jordan asked the Lord about the manner of light for the vessels, the Lord answered him with a question of his own. What will ye that I should do that you may have light in your vessels? According to President Harold B. Lee, the Lord's question was similar to saying the following, Well, you have you any good ideas? What would you suggest that we should do in order to have light? Then the Lord went away and left him alone. It was as though the Lord were saying to him, Look, I gave you a mind to think with, and I gave you agency to use it. Now you do all you can to help yourself with this problem. And then after you've done all you can, I'll step in to help you. After considering the possibilities, the brother of Jared demonstrated his great faith by asking the Lord to touch 16 stones and supply light. The Lord answered his plea and not only provided light for the vessels, but gave, his, gave this faithful man a vision unlike any other. Presently concluded, this is the principle in action. If you want the blessing, don't just kneel down and pray about it. Prepare yourself in every conceivable way you can in order to make yourself worthy to receive the blessing you seek. End of quote. Chapter 3, verse 4. Touch these stones, O Lord, with thy finger, and prepare them, that they may shine forth in darkness, and they shall shine forth unto us in the vessels which we have prepared. 
In the book of Genesis, we get a hint of maybe how the brother Jared got the idea of touching stones to make them give off light. In Genesis 6.16, it says about the ark, building the ark, a window shalt thou not thou shalt make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou furnish it above. However, the footnote to verse 16 says the Hebrew word toshar, some rabbis believe it was a precious stone that shone in the ark. Much like the barges of the Jaredites could not have windows because the ark would break, it appears that the same was true for Noah's ark. Thus, the ark appears to have a stone that's shown in the ark to give light. Maybe this, this is where the brother Jared got the idea from the Lord of touching the 16 stones. So the Hebrew word for window is tzohar, which some writers believe that was, could be translated as a stone instead of a window. And maybe from reading the account of Noah, brother of Jared got the idea. Chapter 3, verses 16 through 13. Here is a record of one of the great theophanies of all time. Because of his knowledge of and his trust in Jehovah, this man was allowed, first of all, to have the veil which separates mortals from immortal, immortals parted in a way as to behold the finger of God of the patriarchs. Then, after exerting his faith in it, Asserting his desire to see even more, he was allowed the consummate privilege of seeing the Lord and of communing with him on the promised basis. That is to say, the brother Jared enjoyed the blessings of the second comforter, the personal presence and ministration of the Lord God himself. The faith of Moriankomer was powerfully childlike. His trust was absolute. His reliance on the Lord was complete, and thus the Lord trusted him. Verse, chapter 3, verse 6, it was as the finger of a man. A modern revelation explains that the spirit of man is in the likeness of his physical person. The experience here verifies that principle. The finger of Jehovah, a premortal being who would not take a physical body for more than two millennia from that time, resembled a physical finger, so much so that the brother Jared supposed that he was beholding the physical. Chapter 3, verse 6, the brother Jared fell down before the Lord, for he was struck with fear. Nothing was more well established in the minds of the ancients than the necessity of holiness, the certain knowledge that unholy men would be unprepared and thus would be consumed in the presence of God of glory. Chapter 3, verse 8, I knew not that the Lord had flesh and blood. Again, the prophet was astonished by the fact that the finger of the Lord appeared to be real, tangible, and physical, when in fact he would not take a mortal body for some 2,000 years. Chapter 3, verse 11. Believest thou the words which I shall speak? This question stands as a type of divine pre-assessment, an effort to know whether the brother Jared is truly ready for what is about to take place. Chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, Lord, I know that thou speakest the truth, for thou art God of truth, and canst not lie. It is not just that God will not lie. He cannot. It is contrary to his divine nature. Nor can he be anything less than absolute and infinitely knowledgeable, just, merciful, and kind. For the people of God to believe anything else is to place themselves in a precarious position in regard to their being able to exercise faith in God unto life and salvation. Chapter 3, verse 13, Because thou knowest these things, you are redeemed from the fall. Because the brother Jared knew there was a God, because he had a correct idea of the character, perfections, and attributes of God, and because he was willing to sacrifice anything to, bear, to better know and serve that God, he gained the assurance that his course in life was pleasing to the heavens. He acquired the quality and kind of faith which brings remission of sins, assures the redemption of souls from death and hell and endless torment, and eventually brings them into the presence of God. His faith was made perfect in and through Christ. It is not simply that the brother Jared had intellectual understanding above, about divine things. He was not merely a bright theologian. Rather, he was a participant in the religion of Jesus Christ, that religion which enlightens the mind and sanctifies the soul. Chapter 3, verse 14. I am he who is prepared from the foundation of the world. 
Joseph Smith said, quote, At the first organization in heaven, we were all present and saw the Savior chosen and appointed and the plan of salvation made and was sanction- and we sanctioned it. End of quote. Jehovah was the chief proponent of the Eternal Father's plan for the salvation of the human family. He was chosen or ordained to come to the earth as Savior and Redeemer, while the amendatory offering of Lucifer was rejected by God. Jesus is the Father and, and the Son in that he was the Eternal Father of heaven and earth, which, created, which creation powers were given to him by the Father. And he is the Son because Heavenly Father is the literal Father of the babe in Bethlehem through the chosen Virgin Mary who gave birth to Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 15, Never have I shown myself unto man. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland teaches us the following concerning this unusual statement. Before examining the doctrinal truths taught in this divine encounter, it would be useful to note two seemingly problematic issues here, issues that seem to have reasonable and acceptable resolutions. The first consideration arises from two questions the Lord asked the brother Jared. Why hast thou fallen, and sawest thou more than this? It is a basic premise of latter-day saint theology that God knoweth all things, and there is not anything save he knows it. The scriptures, both ancient and modern, are replete with assertions of omniscience. Nevertheless, God has frequently asked questions of mortals, usually as a way to test their faith, measure their honesty, or develop their knowledge. For example, he called to Adam in the Garden of Eden, Where art thou? And he later asked Eve, What is it that thou hast done? Yet an omniscient per- parent clearly knew the answer to both questions, for he could see where Adam was, and he had watched what Eve had done. Obviously the questions were for the children's sake, giving Adam and Eve the responsibility to reply honestly. Later, in trying Abraham's faith, God would repeatedly call out about Abraham's whereabouts, to which the faithful patriarch would answer, Here am I. God's purpose was not to obtain information he already knew, but to reaffirm Abraham's fixed faith in confronting the most difficult of all parental tests. Such questions are frequently used by God, particularly in his assessing faith, honesty, and the full measure of agency, allowing his children the freedom and opportunity to express themselves as revealingly as they wish, even though God knows the answer to his own and all other questions. The second issue that requires brief comment stems from the Lord's exclamation, Never has man come before me with such exceeding faith as thou hast, for were not so you could not have seen my finger. And later, never have I shown myself unto man whom I have created, for never has man believed in me as thou hast. The potential for confusion here comes with the realization that many, and perhaps all, of the major prophets living prior to the brother Jared had seen God. How then do we account for the Lord's declaration? Adam's face-to-face conversation with God in the garden can be exempted because of the paradisiacal pre-fallen state of that setting and relationship. Furthermore, other prophets' vision of God, such as those of Moses, Isaiah, and the Bible, or Nephi and Jacob in the Book of Mormon, can also be answered because they came after this never-before experience of the brother of Jared. But before the time of the brother of Jared, the Lord did appear to Adam and the residue of his posterity, who were righteous in the valley of Adam on Diamon, three years before Adam's death. And we are left with Enoch, who explicitly said, I saw the Lord, and he stood before my face, and he talked with me, even as a man talketh one with another face to face. We assume that other prophets between the fall and the Tower of Babel saw God in a similar manner, including Noah, who found grace in the eyes of the Lord and walked with God, the same scriptural phrase used to describe Enoch's relationship with the Lord. This issue has been much discussed by Latter-day Saint writers, and there are several possible explanations, any one or all of which may cast light upon the larger truth of this passage. Nevertheless, without additional revelation or commentary on the matter, any conjecture is only that, and as such is inadequate and incomplete. One possibility is that this is simply a comment made in the context of one dispensation as such applies only to the people of Jared and the Jaredite prophets, that Jehovah had never before revealed himself to one of their seers and revelators. 
Obviously, this theory has several limitations when measured against such phrases as never before and never has man. Furthermore, we quickly realize that the brother, that Jared and his brother are the fathers of their dispensations, the very first to whom God could have revealed himself in their era. Another suggestion is that the reference to man is the key to this passage, suggesting that the Lord had never revealed himself to the unsanctified, to the non-believer, to temporal, earthly, natural man. The implication is that only those who have put off the natural man, only those who are untainted by the world, in short, the sanctified, such as Adam, Enoch, and now the brother Jared, are entitled to this privilege. So when he says, I never show myself unto man, he's saying, I have never before shown myself unto the natural man. You must become sanctified like Mahan Rai Moriankumar and Enoch and others had become sanctified. Some believe that the Lord meant he had never before revealed himself to man in that degree or to that extent. This theory suggests that divine appearances to earlier prophets had not been with the same fullness that never before had the veil been lifted to give such a complete revelation of Christ's nature and being. Further possibility is that this is the first time Jehovah had appeared and identified himself as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with the interpretation of the passage being, Never have I shown myself as Jesus Christ unto man whom I have created. That possibility is reinforced by one way of reading Moroni's later editorial comment, Having this perfect knowledge of God, he could not be kept from within the veil. Therefore, he saw Jesus. Yet another interpretation of this passage is that the faith of the brother Jared was so great, he saw not only the spirit finger and body of the premortal Jesus, which presumably many other prophets have also seen, but also some distinctly more revealing aspects of Christ's body of flesh and blood and bone. Exactly what insights into the temporal nature of Christ's future body the brother of Jared could have had is not clear. But Jehovah did say to him, Because of thy faith, thou hast seen that I shall take upon me flesh and blood. And Moroni said that Christ revealed himself in this instance in the likeness of the same body, even as he showed himself unto the Nephites. Some have taken that to mean literally the same body the Nephites would see, a body of flesh and bones. A stronger position would suggest that it was only the spiritual likeness of that future body. In emphasizing that this was a spiritual body being revealed and not some special precursor stim simulating flesh and bone, Jehovah said, This body which ye now behold is the body of my spirit, and even as I appear to thee in the spirit will I appear unto my people in the flesh. Moroni also affirmed this saying, Jesus showed himself unto this man in the spirit. A final explanation, and in terms of the brother Jared's faith, a most per persuasive one is that Christ was saying to the brother Jared, never have I shown myself unto a man in this manner without my volition, driven slowly by the faith of the beholder. As a rule, prophets are invited into the presence of the Lord, are bidden to enter his presence by him and only with his sanction. The brother Jared, on the other hand, seems to have thrust himself through the veil, not as an unwelcome guest, but perhaps technically as an uninvited one. Said Jehovah, never has man come before me with such exceeding faith as thou hast, for were it not so, ye could have not seen my finger. Never has man believed in me as thou hast. Obviously, the Lord himself was linking unprecedented faith with this unprecedented vision. If the vision itself was not unique, then it had to be the faith and how the vision was obtained that was so unparalleled. The only way that faith could be so remarkable was its ability to take the prophet uninvited where others had been able to go only with God's bidding. That appears to be Moroni's understanding of the circumstance when he later wrote, Because of the knowledge which came as a result of faith of this man, he could not be kept from withholding within the veil. Therefore, having the perf this, this perfect knowledge of God, he could not be kept from within the veil. Therefore, he saw Jesus. So maybe this is the only time that man, uninvited, was able to enter the presence of God and that God did not invite him to do that. He was able to go and see because of the amount of faith he had, uninvited at first by Jehovah. 
This may be one of those provocative examples, except that here is a real experience and not hypothetical. A theologian might cite in a debate about God's power. Students of religion sometimes ask, can God make a rock so heavy that he cannot lift? Or can God hide in an item, can hide an item so skillfully that he cannot find it? Far more movingly and importantly, one may ask here, is it possible to have faith so great that God cannot resist it? At first, one is inclined to say that surely God could block such an experience if he wished to, but this text suggests otherwise. This man could not be kept from beholding within the veil. He could not be kept from within the veil. So he had so much faith that even God could not resist it, and he was led beyond the veil. This may be an unprecedented case of a mortal man's desire, will, and purity so closely approaching the heavenly standard that God could not but honor his devotion. What a remarkable doctrinal statement about the power of mortal's faith, and not an, eth an ethereal, unreachable unre select mortal either. This was a man who once forgot to call upon the Lord. One whose best ideas were sometimes focused on rocks, and one who doesn't even have a t traditional name in the book that has his immortalized, his unprecedented experience. Given such faith, we should not be surprised that the Lord would show this prophet much, show him visions that would be relevant to the mission of all the Book of Mormon prophets and to the events of the Latter-day Dispensation in which the book would be received. End of Elder Holland's quote and comments concerning on what it meant when he said, never have man seen God before as thou hast. Chapter 3, verse 15, man whom I have created. Here Jehovah speaks in broad terms and by divine investiture of authority. Jehovah was, under the direction and appointment of the Father, the, the executive in the creation. He created all things on earth except man. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught, quote, When it came to placing man on earth, there was a change in creators. That is, the Father himself became personally involved. All things were created by the Son, using the power delegated by the Father, except man. In the Spirit and again in the flesh, man was created by the Father. There was no delegation of authority where the crowning creature of creation was concerned. End of quote. Chapter 3, verse 19, he had faith no longer. From an eternal perspective, knowledge and faith are not antithetical, nor are they on opposite ends of the continuum. God possesses all knowledge, and God possesses all faith. Indeed, he, it is by virtue of his faith existing in him in perfection as a principle of power that the worlds were made. Elder Bruce R. McConkie has written, quote, In the eternal sense, because faith is the power of God himself, it embraces within its fold a knowledge of all things. This measure of faith, the faith by which the worlds are and were created, and which sustains and upholds all things, is found only among resurrected persons. It is the faith of saved beings. But mortals are in process, through faith, of gaining eternal salvation. Their faith is based on a knowledge of the truth within the meaning of Adam's statement that faith is not to have a perfect Alma's statement, that faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things, but that men have faith when they hope for things which are not seen, which are true. In this sense, faith is both preceded and supplanted by knowledge. And when any person gains a, a perfect knowledge on any given matter, then as pertaining to that thing, his faith is he has faith no longer, or rather his faith is dormant. It has been supplanted by pure knowledge. The brother of Jared stands out as a good illustration of how the knowledge of God is gained by faith, and also of how that perfect knowledge from a mortal perspective replaces faith. Chapter 3, verse 40, 22. When he shall come unto me. Presumably this means something like, before you die, write the things and seal them up. Chapter 3, verse 22. Ye shall write them in a language that they cannot be read. Presumably, Moriakimer was writing in Adamic or a language or the language of God. Chapter 3, verse 23 through 24 and verse 28. These two stones. The prophet Joseph Smith used the same Urim and Thummim that was given to the brother of Jared upon the mount when he talked with the Lord face to face. President Joseph Fielding Smith wrote a brief history regarding the Urim and Thummim. Quote, King Mosiah possessed two stones which were fastened into the two rims of a bow called 
by the Nephites interpreters, which were with, with which he translated the Jaredite record. And these were handed down from generation to generation for the purpose of interpreting languages. How Mosiah came into possession of the two stones or the ermine thumb on the record does not tell us, more than to say that it was a gift from God. Mosiah had these gift of the ermine thumb before the people of Limhi discovered the record of Ether. They may have been received when the large stone was brought to Mosiah with gravings upon it, which he interpreted by the gift and power of God. They may have been given to him or to some other prophets before his day, just as the brother of Jared received them from the Lord. That the Urim and Thummim, or two stones, given to the brother of Jared with those in the possession of Mosiah, appears evident from the Book of Mormon teachings. The brother of Jared was commanded to seal up his writings of the vision he had when Christ appeared to him, so that they could not be read by the people. The Urim and Thummim were also sealed up so that they could not be used for the purpose of interpreting those sacred writings and visions until such time as the Lord should grant unto man to interpret them. When they were to be revealed, they were to be interpreted by the aid of the same Urim and Thummim. Joseph Smith received with the breastplate and the plates of the Book of Mormon the Urim and Thummim, which were hid up by Moroni to come forth in the last days, as a means by which the ancient records might be translated, which Urim and Thummim were given to the brother of Jared. Chapter 3, verses 25 through 28. He showed unto the brother Jared all the inhabitants of the earth which had been, and also that would be, and he withheld them not from his sight, even unto the ends of the earth. The brother Jared was granted a panoramic vision, that vision which the scriptures tell us had been given to prophet leaders of dispensations, a vision of things from beginning to the end. This he was instructed to seal up. It kind of constitutes or is included in what we know as the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. This sealed book is described by Nephi's recordings as containing a revelation from God from the beginning of the world to the ending thereof. When it comes forth, it will reveal all things from the foundation of the world unto the end thereof. Oh, that we could have that sooner than later. What a great blessing that will be when we get that revealed to us. When during the millennium, the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon is translated, it will give us an account of life and pre-existence, of the creation of all things, of the fall and the atonement and the second coming, of temple ordinance and their fullness, of the ministry and mission of translated beings, of life in the spirit world in both paradise and hell, of the kingdoms of glory to be inhabited by resurrected beings, and many such things. That was Elder McConkie's opinion that he taught that we would get the sealed portion during the millennium. Chapter Ether, chapter 4. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. They were forbidden to come unto the children of man until after he should be lifted upon the cross. They should not come unto the world until after Christ should show himself unto his people. It appears that from these verses, the sealed portion of the gold plates that contained the record that the brother of Jared wrote, and then sealed up to come forth after the resurrection of the Savior when he showed himself unto the Nephites. However, by the time of Moroni's lifetime, these records that Moroni wrote upon the gold plates that were from the writings of the brother of Jared were sealed up and hid again because of the wickedness of the people. Chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Moroni here speaks of a day of consummate righteousness, a day of faith, a day of universal good and brotherhood. Surely the day we know is the millennium. It is a day when the generality of the people exerc when general generality of the people exercise faith like Moriancomer, when the saints possess power with their God sufficient to penetrate the veil and enjoy communion with holy beings. In that day, when the people of the Lord are living up to their privilege, when those who have come out of the world are basking in the glorious light of Christ the Lord, and when the covenant people have searched and studied and pondered and taught consistently from the scriptures they have been given, then, in that day, the Lord God will bestow new knowledge, vouchsafe new scripture, confer new and sacred understanding that has been known but by few of the earth's inhabitants. He will give to the faithful all that the brother of Jared received. Chapter 4, verse 8, For unto them will I show no greater things. God reveals himself to the humble, to those who know their weakness and their limits, who gladly acknowledge them, and who earnestly open themselves to further light knowledge from him who is eternal. Chapter 4, verses 11 through 12, For it persuadeth men to do good. Whatsoever thing persuadeth men to do good is of me. 
Ronai gives a key on how we can know if the inspiration we receive is from ourselves or from God. Satan cannot persuade men to do good. Only God can do that. Thus, if you are impressed to do something that is good, meaning that which causes one to come in Christ, then you can rest assured it is from God. That should be can and not man. Chapter 4, verse 15. When men and women forsake the ways of the world and cleanse their hands and feet through the waters of regeneration, they then open themselves to the revelations of God. Among the sacred treasures to be made known to those who hunger and thirst after truth is their personal and fam familial identity, their lineage as pertaining to the house of Israel, their place in the plan of the Father. Nephi explained his errant brethren, and at that latter day shall the remnant of our seed know that they are of the house of Israel, that they are the covenant people of the Lord, and then shall they know and come to, know, to the knowledge of their forefathers, and also the knowledge of the gospel of their Redeemer. Wherefore, they shall come to the knowledge of their Redeemer, and the very points of his doctrine, that they may know how to come unto him and be saved. Chapter 3, verse 17, one of the great signs of the Father's work in the last days, the work of the gathering of Israel, is the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, this record. In this sense, the Book of Mormon is itself one of the signs of the times. Chapter 4, verse 19, faithful unto my name. Those who speak and act in the name of the Lord with dignity and propriety, who function in the faith of Jesus Christ in evident respect and reverence towards that name, the name that is above all other names, who through obedience and fidelity to that holy name manifest their Christianity, these shall come into eternity to bear the holy name everlastingly, like the 144,000 high priests who have the name of God sealed upon their foreheads. So shall the people of the Lord, who have been true to the name of Christ, be sealed everlastingly to him. In addition, we are faithful we are faithful to the name of Christ as we are faithful, loyal, supportive, and respectful to those called to speak in his holy name, meaning his prophets. Chapter 4, verse 19, the kingdom prepared for him from the foundation of the world. Those, those who have kept the statutes and commandments of God in their first estate, who are true and faithful to every trust in the premortal existence, were promised certain blessings, including thrones, principalities, and powers associated with eternal life and the everlasting continuation of the family, all on a conditional basis. When they come to earth, receive the gospel and its attendant covenants and ordinances, and live in such a manner as to merit the gifts and blessings of the Spirit, they qualify in time, either here or hereafter, to receive unconditionally what they had been promised before they came here. That is to say, their calling and election to eternal life, which had its origins in the first estate, is made sure. Ether, chapter 5, our last chapter. Chapter 5, verse 1, Touch them not in order that ye may translate. Moroni held the keys of the record of the stick of Ephraim. This appears to be a special charge to Joseph Smith, the modern seer and translator, a directive that he is not to touch or translate the sealed portion of the record. In speaking through Nephi, the Savior said, Presumably to that same seer, Touch not the things which are sealed, for I will bring them forth in my own due time. For I will show them unto the children of men that I am able to do mine own work. Chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. Here Moroni instructs Joseph Smith concerning the calling of witnesses, chosen persons who will be, like the seer who brought forth the record, commissioned by God to bear solemn testimony of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. Wherefore, by the words of three, God said, I will establish my word. Nephi had been prophesied some 550 years before the coming of Christ. Wherefore, at that day when the book shall be delivered unto a man of whom I have spoken, Joseph Smith, the book, specifically the place, shall be hid from before the eyes of the world, that the eyes of none shall behold it, save it be three witnesses shall behold it by the power of God, besides him whom the book shall be delivered, and they shall testify the truth of the book and the things thereon. Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris were each moved upon by the Spirit with the desire to become the witnesses so named in the Book of Mormon, and inquired of the prophet accordingly. The Lord confirmed that assignment upon them, and thus their sacred witness is attached to every copy of the Book of Mormon.
Not only would three chosen witnesses bear record, testimony of the divine origin and the providential hand in the translation of the record, but also the Book of Mormon itself, called here this work, would attest by the Spirit of its own truthfulness. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, which is one God, one in mind, and thought, and purpose, and glory, will attest in great power to those who are earnest in their search for truth that this precious record is the mind and will, the voice of God to man. It is indeed holy scripture. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles stated, The solemn written testimony of three witnesses to what they saw and heard, two of them simultaneously and a third almost immediately thereafter, is entitled to great weight. Indeed, we know that upon the testimony of one witness, great miracles have been claimed and accepted by many religious people. And in the secular world, the testimony of one witness has been deemed sufficient for weighty penalties and judgments. Persons experienced in evaluating testimony commonly consider a witness opportunity to observe an event and possibility of his bias on the subject. Where different witnesses give identical testimony about the same event, skeptics look for evidence of collusion among them or for other witnesses who could contradict them. Measured against all these possible objections, the testimony of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon stands forth in great strength. Each of the three had ample reason and opportunity to renounce their test his testimony if it had been false or to equivocate on details if any had been inaccurate. As is well known, because of disagreements or jealousy involving other leaders of the church, each of these three witnesses was excommunicated from the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints by about eight years after the publication of their testimony. All three went their separate ways, with no common interest to support a conclusive effort. Yet, to the end of their lives, periods ranging 12 to 50 years after their excommunication, not one of these witnesses deviated from his published testimony or said anything that cast any shadow on its truthfulness. Furthermore, their testimony stands uncon uncontradicted by any other witness. Reject it one may, but how does one explain three men of good character uniting and persisting in this published testimony to the end of their lives in the face of great ridicule and other personal disadvantage? Like the Book of Mormon itself, there is no better explanation than is given in the testimony itself, that solemn t statement of good and honest men who told what they saw. Witnesses are important, and the testimony through witnesses of the Book of Mormon is impressive and reliable. End of Elder Oaks quote. Chapter 5, verse 4. All this shall stand as a testimony against the word of the last days. Indeed, the Book of Mormon is not simply another book about religion. Salvation itself is at stake in anyone's appraisal of it. By the book shall the world be judged. There's a great warning right there to all of us. Thank you for watching. I hope this helped you with some of these chapters in the Book of Ether. And if it did, please hit the like button.